I got to pull a little bit of a J.J. Abrams here, a little bit of a time jump. When you watch the rest of this video, you're going to see that this brown here is way more red um, than it is right now. Uh, that's because uh, I chose, I incorrectly chose a color. Uh, I wasn't satisfied with it in the end. And having recently unpacked one of my Slaughter's Marauders vehicles, uh, I bit the bullet and decided to hand mix a color. Um, I wanted to keep this as basic as possible, like one one color right out of a, a can, but you can see there with that color matching, this is the links is a little dusty there, but we're uh, pretty spot on there and it really brings it into the universe. I mean, you can see these two beside each other here that they look like they were painted in the same factory. At least I like to think so. So this tutorial process will be warts and all, um, and I wanted to cover this right now to keep you on the right track. So when I mentioned to me a red brown XF64, I'm actually using a hand mix of Vallejo Game Color Terracotta and Vallejo Model Color Dark Gray. The reason being is that the dark gray I found toned down the redness in the terracotta. In fact, there's almost a little bit of blue in the dark gray. And I know that sounds confusing and I didn't want to get into this, but it kind of has to be done for accuracy's sake in my case. Um, but the dark gray interacts with the red in here to purple up the, the brown, right? So basically adds a little bit of blue in here while darkening it. Uh, and I found maybe a 99% match by doing that. Uh, exact ratios for mixing. All I did was I poured a bunch of this into my trusty palette here. Here's the color right here. And I just put some gray in another spot and I just added gray until I was happy. Um, you may not get it right on the first bat. Hand mixing takes practice. Uh, and I was hoping to do a separate video on that, but we had to jump into it for right now. Um, again, you'll see later on in the video, this is much more red than it is now, but right now it's more accurate. So just ignore the fact that it's red in the tutorial because the rest of the techniques still apply. It's just the color that's off. Uh, so without further ado, let's get on with painting, shall we? And welcome to the next video. Episode two of the Slaughter's Marauders hand brushing series. In the last episode, we left you off with priming the, uh, the base of your model. In this episode, we're gonna talk about some very quick and very simple techniques in order to brush paint, add color to your vehicle to give you a Slaughter's Marauders look. This can be applied to other teams as well. You could do it with Tiger Force, you could completely hand brush that. Uh, you could technically do it with Python Patrol as well, but you're going to have to apply a bigger amount of patience for that. Um, so I've already done the top and I already talked about that. And the reason why is because I wanted to get the right colors at least in my opinion, um, and to show you how you map to another side of your vehicle. So before we begin, I'm going to refresh your memory for the uh, paint colors we've chosen for this project. So we've got XF64 Red Brown by Tamiya. We've got XF26 Deep Green by Tamiya. I've got Citadel Color Layer Scaven Blight Dinge, and it's called Layer because you'll need to use more than one to get the effect you want in this case. And, last but not least, Vallejo Game Color Goblin Green. Uh, I've poured out some Goblin Green into my trusty palette here. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this green stripe here on the nose and I'm going to bring it around the bottom of this. Now, first things first, we talked about a loaded brush. A loaded brush has paint in all the bristles. If you scoop up paint and you have a gob of paint sitting on the bristles, that's not a loaded brush. That's a recipe for disaster. So make sure the brush is loaded with color, not heaped with color. Now with the vehicle hull held together loosely in hand, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna very gently touch this, the brush to the second part of the hull, the lower part of the hull here, roughly in line with the top line. So now what I've done is I've married that up and I've matched it up. So I've anchored my my line on the bottom part. And now just some nice smooth strokes here. You can see that the primer still shows through. It doesn't go opaquely all the way through and that's fine. Um, with black basing or black priming, you're gonna have to do that. Going white could help you if you want. Um, this is honestly a habit from uh, building models. I, I prefer using black a lot underneath for various realistic weathering purposes and whatnot. Um, so now all I'm doing is I'm carrying that line roughly over to this side. And you'll notice that on this side, the stripe is actually wider than it is here. So I'm naturally gonna make this stripe a little bit wider as it goes. Um, 
you don't need to put masking tape on there to make it perfect. Um, because if you notice on Slaughter's Marauders vehicles, like any other G.I. Joe vehicle, um, it's not as straight as you think it is. Um, and what that does is it gives you permission to relax a bit while you're doing this. Because uh, there's enough stressful things in life and painting your G.I. Joe vehicle should not be one of them. So here we go. Now I'm just touching up a spot on the bottom there. So now I'm going to do the same thing the other side because now I'm getting close, close together here. And if you make mistakes, that's fine. You can cover it up with the other color. So don't, uh, don't get upset if your brush control isn't like super Bob Rossi or anything like that. And then I'm just going to quickly bring the paint down. And I can feel the paint drying up here. So the trick, like we talked about, is a moist brush. So I'm going to re-wet my brush, dab off the excess on some paper towel, reload my brush. And here you can see it is again loaded. And I'll bring it back and carry on my line. So precision here is not the goal. The goal is coverage. The precision comes as you get to the outside edges of your line. And in, you could almost call it the editing process. So when you go back over and basically move the line's edges to where you want them to go. So in this case, I'm just trying to get all the green roughly where I want it and see if I'm happy with it. Uh, I know that may seem kind of flip floppy. It's like, how do I know I'm going to be happy with it? Well, you'll know because the pattern is continued with the pattern that you were successful with the other piece on. So a little bit of a line there. Yeah, okay. Let's straighten that out a bit. Some of this will uh, sort itself out once you put the second layer on. And you can see it's very streaky there. That's still the black primer showing through, and that's fine because we talked about uh, priming with black and having to put technically more paint on. Uh, and when I say more paint, all of these are relative terms. Um, it comes from, my understanding of this, doing this sort of thing comes from building models where you want to go as kind of minimalistic in your application of everything as possible to get that scale look. Um, it's really no different than this because what you're trying to do is replicate painted plastic. So um, as a reference, if you have a GI Joe collection, check out your Tiger Force vehicles. Um, the spray painting done on that or the airbrushing or whatever. Um, and you'll see what I mean when you look at the brown section and the tiger stripes themselves. That uh, little mini imperfections. Um, maybe there's more curve there than you thought. Or maybe the black isn't as opaque as you thought it was when you uh, just looked at it casually. Because now that what I've noticed is that the more you get into custom painting and stuff like that, when you examine your source material because you want to try and replicate it as closely as you can, you start noticing all the little flaws with it. And I don't think that detracts from it. In fact, I think it actually makes it better uh, realizing that you, you know, human beings kind of did this stuff. I'm sure it was some machine work and everything like that, but nothing's perfect is what it boils down to. So we're just going to leave that to dry, but that's roughly where I want my color mapped out to. And I'm satisfied roughly with that line. Like I said, we're going to further refine the edges of it with the other colors. So that's the dark green there, or excuse me, that's the light green. Whew. I've only had 17 copies today. Um, and I'm just going to use the rest of my paint elsewhere on the model that's the same color. Um, sometimes I do it, sometimes I don't. I think we can all agree that if you can be um, resource mindful while you're painting, you can stretch your paint dollar a little bit further. So we'll just wash the brush off. And another pro tip too, this is actually starting to become borderline here, is that after a while, especially when you use the black primer, um, you'll notice your water gets black very quickly. Um, I'll, be, I'll be sloppy and I'll say that if you didn't change your water out once while you're doing the black priming process, not a problem because you're using black. But when you switch to the other colors, change your water, make sure it's nice and clear, and you'll probably have to change your water more than once during this process. Uh, just because what will happen is, is, yes, the water gets murky, uh, and that's dissolved paint in there, right? So um, if I put brown on there, it's going to change the water colors again. And then when you put your brush in there, even to moisten it, that colored water is going to be in your brush. And then that's going to mix with the paint and technically alter the color of the paint. Um, you'll notice that if you try and do touch-ups closer when you're done and your water is dirty, is that the color will suddenly be different. And you'll be like, what the heck's going on? And that's the reason, is that you're using dirty water. So in this case, 
my water's getting a little green. Um, but not green enough to stop me, so I'm going to uh, do the other green, so the XF26 dark green here. And I'm going to paint this big old stripe here in this greedlead area. So the painting for the greedlead areas is uh, the same as it is with everything else. We've talked about this multiple times now. You should be comfortable with it by now. Is that it's a vertical kind of stabbing motion with the brush or dabbing motion if you're, uh, if you're like that. And then you can always just wiggle the brush in there, kind of work the bristles in there and let the bristles of the brush do the work for you. Um, if you magically find that you want to watch someone doing a canvas painting because it's relaxing, you'll hear that often is let the bristles do the work for you. It's just like sandpaper, let the sandpaper do the work. You scrubbing it faster or harder doesn't suddenly make the grit any rougher on sandpaper, right? And you Charlie horse your arm and then you got to tell your friends at work and then everybody makes fun of you because you Charlie horse your arm using sandpaper. Um, and nobody wants that in their life. I still have some green paint here, so I'm actually going to go back and uh, apply some more to where I need to. Let's see if I can get away with uh, some cheekiness here. I'm just going to drop that right in there. No primer. Let's see what happens. This is a live test of Vallejo Game Colors uh, adhesion. That's not bad. It is sticking. I always say prime. I always say prime. Um, I've tried a few things where I've not primed and it's technically been okay. But for me to go, you do not need to prime would be a straight out lie. Um, it's always safer to prime. It's like I said, primer gives uh, the following paint something to bite onto, right? Um, and that's what we're that's what we're looking for here is, is successful completion of a custom. Um, if you put paint on an unprimed surface and you touch it with your thumb even after it's cured and it just rubs away, like, what was the point, right? So, take the extra time, do that extra step, and uh, hate yourself less later. Yeah, still a little bit left here. I'm just gonna shove this on here. And I, I say that term, you know, relatively speaking. Right? <laughs> I've scaled my responses to match the scale of the vehicle I'm painting. There you go. There, that's a good use of color. Now when you've used your paint, you gotta let that sit, okay? I know, it may drive you up the walls like, oh, I can see the primer and everything, just, it's the first coat. Relax, it'll be fine, daddy's got gotcha. you. So, let's do a quick change out here. Now what I will show you is my water is quite green there. Uh, it may not seem like it on camera, but I'm looking at it and it's pretty green. So I'm gonna swap this out because the next color I'm gonna use is a red brown and we don't wanna mix green with that because it's gonna change the effect. So just hang on two seconds here. All right, so I'm back with clean water. You can see all the way to the bottom and all my previous mistakes in life, just kidding. And I've already shaken my Tamiya red brown and I like to take it out of the lid uh, and then once the lid's dried up, I sometimes go into the jar or sometimes I'll just reshake the jar and go out of the lid again. All that does is that it lets me, uh, well, I don't know what it does exactly, but it's just what I do. And we're still waiting on the light green to dry fully. You can still see it's shiny in some places. It's not inherently a gloss paint, it's more matte, uh, but we're going to carry on with the color next to it. It's going to look like hell when you first do your first layers here. Um, and it's gonna be like, oh my God, what am I doing? Just, you're fine. It's just the first layer of everything and we're doing this to get the colors on, right? Um, could you do one color complete, wait till it's uh, perfect and carry on? Yeah, sure. But in this case, I'm gonna show you where you meet up colors. And you don't wanna do this right next to a wet color. Like at all. <laughs> Other than that, the brush strokes, as you can see, are really simple. They're really simple. There's not much to it at all. Um, I'm not going to say it doesn't take practice to get, you know, good at it, but uh, there are certainly more difficult things in life, like uh, brain surgery. There. Brain surgery is probably more difficult. Although with some of the people I've met in life, I'm pretty sure. Well, anyways, that's a discussion for another time. So same thing again, right? We're coming up to the edge here, so we're just going to apply our paint on that lower edge so that it matches the top edge. I can even see a couple of mistakes here, which I'm going to rectify right now. Boof, done. And we're just going to carry it on down the side here. 
And now I'm going to make sure my brush has got a good amount of paint on it. We'll talk about loaded again. And I'm going to put it right on the edge there. And I'm going to try and keep it off the green but covering all the black. Just like that. A little bit more. And there you go. That's all you're doing. Once you like you can go fast doing this other stuff, but once you get there, you want to slow down a little bit and just draw your line and phew, swoop move. Now you can see here, this is the uh, phenomenon I was telling you about uh, with Tamiya, is that I put some some of the paint down and when I go try and go over it, the brush lifts it all off, um, which is what really ticks me off about Tamiya. I think it's something I'm doing wrong, uh, to be honest with you, but uh, I'll just cover that over because it needs another coat. That's about the size of it. So you can see there we've married up our colors, right, roughly. And you can just go in there and fine tune whichever one you want with whichever color you want. Try not to do light over dark because uh, it'll force you to use more paint. That's a good rule to start with. As you use other paint brands, you might discover some of them have better opacity, in which case it may not matter. But now you can see on the top and the bottom of the hull, I've got my dark green, my brown, and my light green. And I'm just going to carry that on through the rest of the hull. Uh, other than that, that's all there is to it. Um, I know you say, you might be saying, well, of course there's sale, you know, you're already done. I'm not done, not by a long shot. But this is the point where I say, brush painting takes longer. Full stop. Um, we talked about the health advantages, but again, like I said, if you uh, want to avoid aerosolized products, brush painting is the way to go. Um, it does require more work. That's the whole point of having spray cans and, air, and airbrushes is that they make stuff go faster and better. Um, Technically, if you take your time and do this right, um, you will absolutely be able to knock out a great custom. And uh, we're going to keep going with this because this has actually been a lot of fun. So keep those techniques I, I told you in mind. Uh, if you come up with some new tips, then leave them in the comments below. And if you haven't seen any of these videos before and this is your first video with me, welcome to it. And uh, please like and subscribe. And we'll see you on the next video where we talk about clear coating. So. Watch your brush strokes, keep your water clean, and remember, have fun. Till next time.